Vermont. A sprawling expanse of forests and farmland take up most of this state. Known for its natural beauty and being one of the leaders in maple syrup production and expense of ski resorts and perhaps even more obscure things like a famous ice cream maker and teddy bear factory. But what on the surface would strike as a pristine area to raise a family or go out and experience the outdoors, this state holds many tales and secrets, most of which include creatures and monsters that defy logic and reasoning. What makes this state such a haven for the animals of the mysterious and unknown variety? And is there any evidence to support the existence of these creatures? Today on Unblurring the Unknown, the very first entry in our Cryptids Across America series, the Green Mountain State of Vermont. Welcome back to Unblurring the Unknown. As always, I am your host, Dominic. And this is the very first entry in our Cryptids Across America series. And joining me today for this episode and for the future Cryptids Across America episodes, co-host, my brother Garrick. Hey guys, what's going on? Happy to be back. Now, how this episode is going to go and how we've structured it is that both me and my brother have found some cryptids that we have researched and we will share both of them and discuss if we think there is any evidence to say whether or not these creatures exist and possibly some theories as to what they could be. And at the very end, we will wrap it all up with final thoughts. Now, this is a little bit of a different structure compared to other episodes, but I hope you like this little change in pace. So, with that being said, we each have selected some cryptids that we have found over throughout the state of Vermont. Um, we each have two of them, and the hardest part of this is figuring out who goes first. So, Garrick, you have a random number generator? Is that how we're going to do it? Yeah. So, I have... Uh, numbers one through. Actually, I was gonna do odds or evens, so I'll do yeah, one. Yeah, just do odds and evens. Yeah, um, I'll do one through twenty six. I had one through twenty five, but twenty five makes one and twenty five odds. That's so uh, odds and evens. Uh, odds and you're thinking about it too hard. Okay, okay, <laughs> one through twenty five. Odds or evens. What's your pick? Evens. Evens. So if you win it, you go first. If I win, I go first. We... Yeah, I do t best two out of three. Best two out of three? Mm -hmm. The listeners are going to get this banter back and forth. Okay. So, it's fine. 22, that's even. Yeah, so best two out of three. That means it's me. One you. Yeah, that means I'd have to go first. 16. Okay, even. so I'm so going first. You're first. Okay. So, the very first cryptid I have selected is a lake monster. Now, a lot of people know of Champ the monster of Lake Champlain, and how much it is often kind of bunched together with the legend of Nessie and Loch Ness. However, what you might not know, and what I didn't know until we looked into this, is that a similar creature has been reported in Lake Memphremagog. Now, where, where is Lake Memphremagog? What is Lake Memphremagog? Lake Memphremagog is a glacial lake that sits between Vermont and Canada. A majority of it is in Quebec. However, Vermont has a big chunk that kind of falls into their territory. Even though it lacks in size compared to Lake Champlain, the lake is still incredibly deep, reaching a max depth of 351 feet, which would definitely be deep enough to hide something that would be a very large aquatic species, or even maybe a monster, according to what some witnesses think. Now, the earliest recorded sighting of a monster in this lake goes back to 1816. The first sighting would be made by a man named Ralph Mary and his wife. This kind of first iteration of the creature... Um, it's described more of like a crocodile, and then like later iterations, it's more of like dinosaur, plesiosaur, like or like Champ and Lake Champlain, and Nessie and Loch Ness. Um, so it goes kind of through a character change, I guess, um, within reports um, over over the years. So the first iteration of this creature that was described was described to be the color of a skinned sheep. So I'm assuming that's that's palish skin or white i don't know Gray? i don't know the color of a skin sheep wait give me um, a second i'm gonna google it um with roughly and i quote 12 to 15 pairs of legs um 
I'm not really sure what is responsible for this claim. Um, this yeah, seems to be the. It's kind of white. It's like, like, like skin, white, pink. God, I didn't need to see those photos. Those are gross. Okay. Um. So yeah, not a really pleasant sight, nonetheless. Now, witnesses, like I said, originally described something that looked more like an alligator up until just before the 1900s. In 1891, another witness named William Watt saw the creature swimming across the lake. Watt estimated the creature was roughly 25 to 30 feet long and had a head and neck that rose three feet above the surface of the water, which sounds more like the common dinosaur-like sea monster that I mentioned before and we see across the world. Now, in 1929, Dr. Curtis Clawson would have his sighting with the monster while out with a couple of friends. What they described looked like an oversized alligator with very sharp teeth. So, again, we're back to that the fact that it looks like an alligator. So, it kind of flip-flops in description over the years. Um, this description of the creature would change again in 1933 when a cruise ship that was traveling across the lake saw a, and I quote, elongated snake-like fish measuring over 50 feet in length and almost 10 feet wide. Now, fast forward to 1961, two fishermen had a sighting on the lake in which they would describe a 20-foot-long black creature that swam up alongside their boat. With And the fishermen described it as very... that had a very odd-shaped head that kind of defied explanation... There wasn't really any more details provided when they just said very odd-shaped head, so I'm not really sure what they meant by that. Um, however, if they were seeing a dinosaur or a plesiosaur-like animal, that would kind of make sense, because obviously that would be something that they had never seen before. Um, but if this was an alligator that some witnesses claimed to have seen, I would like to imagine that they would know that it was an alligator, or they would describe it with an alligator-like appearance. So I think that's important to mention. Now... Fast forward and jump again into the 1970s and up to the 2000s. Witnesses say it represents towards the description of a plesiosaur, like I mentioned. However, during my research, I was able to find some accounts that went into extreme detail, and I wanted to share those as well and kind of let me know what you think of them. Garrick, I kind of want to get your feedback on this. I kind of told you a little bit about these before I presented to you. Um, these that, really That's fine, because you know a little bit about mine, too, so it's... Well, yeah, and I, I, I said before that I found a couple really detailed accounts that I felt like you wanted to listen to because they were definitely interesting. Um, one of them was on the weirder side, so just that's coming up. That's the first one, um, and I think it's important, and I think it's kind of interesting to provide you context when we discuss what we could think these are. Sure. Now, this first account I found was from Billy Connor in 1955 who actually became the first person to swim the entire length of the lake at the age of 19 that year. So this account is when Billy Connor swam the entire length of the lake. He was the first person to do it, and this was when he supposedly had his run-in with the creature. How, how long is the lake? It's not short. Like, he went through Vermont and Canada, so it wasn't like... I couldn't find how long the lake was. I found how deep it was, but I couldn't find how long it was. Yeah, and I, I guess it's, you know, like how... Because it goes all the way into Canada, like pretty far. It's a very, it's a very far way. So I'd have to imagine Billy Connor was in very good shape for being nineteen years old. Yeah, I don't think it's a very long and narrow lake. I have a feeling he, I don't know, he definitely didn't swim it lengthwise because that would be like, that's like looks like hundreds of miles. That's, I, he probably swam from like one corner to the other corner like across so if he's like maybe in canada into vermont and... needless to say i don't know that wasn't clarified yeah. it was just said that billy connor was the first person to swim the entire length of the lake so into his account so he wouldn't come forward with this encounter until like 1990 um so he kept this kind of to himself kept it a secret until 1990 when he came forward with this whole encounter that he had now, he told this encounter to Jacques Boisvert of Magog, Quebec, who is, and I hope I pronounced his name right, who is co-founder of the International Dracontology Society of Lake Memphremagog, which firstly, that's a mouthful, but that's basically a society that was, that was made to dedicate towards this lake monster because they think it has something to do with dragons. That's why it's called Dracon, Dracontology. I guess that's the study of dragons, I think. Could be wrong on that, but just... 
I could be wrong, so nobody correct me on that. Or you can, but just don't come at me about it. So, he gave a written statement to Boys Bear that read the following. Dear Jacques, you will recall our recent conversation in your office. I have decided after over 35 years of keeping it to myself, I can relate the bare facts of my swim down Lake Memphremagog. As you know, some of the most beautiful and helpful things that occur to us on this planet, and some of the noblest conceptions that we have, concert things that we cannot prove, or things that require from us a certain degree of faith. One of the most powerful, useful, and beautiful of those is the one which concerns the existence of angels. Again, this he kind of goes off on a little bit of a tangent here right in the beginning, but he does get into the encounter, so I just want to clarify that. That was my impression. Now for the facts otherwise uninterpreted by me. They took place during the night of August 22nd, 1955, when I swam the length of Lake Memphremagog. At McPherson Bay, a lightning storm was raging. It was raining so hard that the drops of water hurt my head, and I was becoming chilled from tensing up. All of a sudden, tout a coup, I was conscious of a present in the water just ahead of me, as I felt about 30 feet below me. It gave a sense of warmth, and without reflecting, I instinctively headed slightly off course to get close to this comforting quote-unquote source. For five minutes I followed this divergence, then I felt that I must bring myself to my senses. Huh, I am a modern man, scientific, you know. But it was too late, my boats have lost me, by now my friend Pitt Lavoy, Garth Jackson, and Alfred Whittier will confirm this. As they were calling me, However, and I called to them, the water ahead of me burst open, and an ugly, ugly to me, and frightening, head emerged from the water. The lips were pursed, and gave me the impression that they were painted with lipstick, and definitely trying to give me the impression that this was a friendly entity, and perhaps even helpful. Being unable to speak, it was giving me sign language, that of the kiss, that I must not be upset, and so strong was the communication that I was not upset, though I questioned my sanity. The heading of the creature, dare I call it an angel, changed radically so that I was heading towards the escorting fleet, and once again on course for Magog. Until we reached the shallowing waters around Bryant's Landing, and with the coming of the overcast dawn, the quote-unquote guide kept herself about 40 yards in front of me and was about the same distance below the escorting boat. Actually, for most of this time, my rowboat was between me and this exceedingly powerful source of comfort. End quote. I hereby certify that this is the story I wish to tell you on this 12th day of November, 1990. Signed, William Connor. Best of luck in your search. Now, Garrick, what is your kind of thoughts about that? Despite the fact that it's very weird. Yeah, that and it's all like, you can tell it's like a French... To English translation, so words are kind of misplaced, or he talks. The and phrasing, yeah. the, the phrasing is definitely weird. I don't know if I don't know if Billy Connor is French in, like, is it just strictly so, French, or, I mean, um, or if he wrote the letter in English, or if he wrote the letter in French. I that I don't know. This was just the quote that I found in my research. But kind of, I mean, you read that story, and there's a lot of things that's kind of like, okay, he's swimming, he's swimming the the lake and it almost seems like to me is that he's getting lost it's raining he's having a hard time struggling has an encounter with the creature basically uses the creature as motivation and thinks it's like a guide to him and follows it the rest of the, the rest of the trip that's at least what i'm making out of it yeah i'm not sure if this is like i feel like maybe he knew about the story before swimming and you know mm -hmm. just saw it because of I don't know, exhaustion or whatever, maybe he, that's, I just, the whole, like, it guided me across the lake thing, just, mm -hmm. I think we won't get, it's, it's weird. we'll save the theories yeah. once I, once I finish up with this next encounter that I find, that I found, um, but that's kind of, that's kind of my thoughts too, I, I was kind of questioned about the whole thing, um, but with that being said, the next detailed sighting that I want to share was from Velma Coburn and her husband Dwayne when they were out on the lake in their boat with family friends, Helena and Earl Hicks. What I am going to read is a transcription of Dwayne's handwritten account of what happened that day. Now before I read this, uh, Dwayne wrote this all down, 
and it's kind of hard to understand at times because he just like he doesn't say like the boat he just says boat um so this is a direct quote from the transcription so it's going to sound weird when i read it but i'm going to read it slow just so you can understand 10 50 p.m july 4th 1974 First sighting of anything unusual was a 30-foot streak of light underwater seen by Helena Hicks. Two or three minutes later, an unmoving object passed by the starboard side of the boat. At this time, object resembled roughly the same size of a blue heron, being about five feet above the water. At this time, boat was cruising at about 1,500 RPM, or an estimated 15 miles per hour. At this sighting, boat increased speed to 22 miles an hour, while making a 180 degree turn and gave chase with the object in spotlight. While giving chase, object looked more like a tail with either a white or fluorescent stripe. Object was chased in the northwest direction for two or three minutes. Chase ended at this time as the operator of the boat and realized he had gotten completely disoriented as to this exact location on the lake and became concerned about rocks and other hazards. At this time, the boat came to a full stop, and so did the object of the chase. At this time, neck, outline, of back of head, became visible in spotlight. The head was six to eight feet above water, shaped similar to a bird or turtle as far as the curve of the back of the head. The head showed, and this is in parentheses, it turned about 120 degrees to face us, close parentheses, two eyes 24 to 36 inches apart. The eyes did not glow red, as many animals in artificial light. They were a pale yellow, or, or light green. The head appeared to be about three feet wide. This was determined by the width of the eyes, and could not distinguish size or location of mouth, depth, or length of head. Neck was 12 to 18 inches thick and long like a snake, probably black or dark brown in color. Eyes were about the size of a baseball. At this time, Chase was completely abandoned. The boat was turned southeast and headed home. Boat was doing 17 or 18 miles an hour, and object was following boat south and stayed about 200 yards back of the boat. This lasted for 10 minutes. Eyes were visible without spotlight. Sighting concluded after 10 minutes of being followed. Signed, Dwayne Coburn. Now, that one sounds more realistic than the Billy Connor sighting, in my opinion. Yeah. Because he, he, he's very, very specific with really everything that he's saying you know the, the like the width of the neck and how far the eyes are apart and the size of the eyes and the color of the eyes i just think there's a lot more detail there than what billy connor said about his yeah sighting. there's there's more detail but there's yeah that's definitely seems has more validity to it than the previous sighting does so well, that being said, these were like these were the two sightings that I found specifically interesting, and like I said, the first one was a little bit more out there, as we just discussed. Where the second one was obviously incredibly detailed as to what they saw and what they encountered. Um, now, the international the international Dracontology Society of Lake Memphremagog had both of these accounts, and they have more, and they are dedicated in doing research into the monster of Lake Memphremagog. And like I said, this is where I pulled these sightings from, and this seems to be the people who shared these sightings to the Dracontology Society of Lake Mount for Magog. Um, these people seem to have had felt more comfortable with sharing their experiences with them as I didn't find these accounts on really any other article site except for this, the, this one that where the interviews were provided by the Dracontology Society. Um, so it obviously seemed that people were more comfortable with sharing their stories to this organization rather than general news outlets. Um, so with that being said, I want to open the floor up to thoughts and theories on the monster of Lake Memphis Magog. So what do you think? Thoughts, theories, Garrett, kind of what is your feedback? I gave you kind of a little bit. What do you think is, what is, what's the theory you have? And I don't have like any I know, the, uh, specific theories because I kind of want to open the floor up a little bit. The first sightings where they're like, it looks kind of like a crocodile. That's more interesting because that's a shape I wouldn't think you'd commonly see. Um, especially in, you know, so far north, you know, Canada. Like, there's no there's no 
crocodiles, there's no alligators, there's nothing like that. So those are more interesting because they said it looks like a crocodile. The other ones where it's like, oh, it's more uh, serpent-like or more like a, you know, a plesiosaur, like a prehistoric dinosaur. Um, the, uh, the serpent ones, I always just think those are, I chalk those up to giant freshwater eels. Mm -hmm. I mean, in those lakes that have, I mean, what's the depth of Lake Memphrey Magog? 351 feet. Yeah, you get in those big cold water lakes, especially those big glacier ones. They have freshwater eels. So it's it's something to me where I think it's easily misidentification of, you know, if it's a, if the report says it's a serpent or like a snake, mm -hmm. I think it's a giant freshwater eel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something usually they stay down really far in the bottom of the lake. And it's not something most people would see a lot, if ever. Mm -hmm. So I think any serpent-like sightings or reports, I would chalk up to a giant, you know, freshwater eel. Mm -hmm. um, as for the sightings where they're like, oh, it's a crocodile with the skin color of a skin sheep. Yeah, that's weird. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a little bit more far out there in terms yeah. of like the whole plesiosaur kind of serpent thing. I mean, Lake Champlain, that's what they think Champ is. They think Champ is a giant eel. They think that that's more than likely what it is. Um, they've done research in Lake Champlain that shows that giant eels can exist there. So it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility for Lake Memphis Magog to have a, a, a collection of giant eels that are at gigantic sizes that could qualify for the reports so i'm gonna second you on that one and i think i'm gonna i'm gonna go with the giant eel theory i think you can go a couple different routes with it but i think that's probably the most plausible yeah. one because i think that's the one that has the most evidence behind it especially with um the research that's done in lake champlain that says similar, yeah. similar things I, I do have to say that the the difference between what they call the lake monsters is it's, it's kind of funny, and I like it a lot. So, Champ in Lake Champlain, of course, it's Champ because it's Lake Champlain, but then people call it Champy. It's just really nice, like, you know, it's not seen as a danger or anything intimidating. And then, like, I googled the Lake Memphis Magog monster, and there's people, there's a couple articles that just call it the Terror, or the Terror of Lake Memphis Magog. And, like, that's funny to me. It's like you go. Well, it's also it's also called Memphre as well. So I think it's kind of some people have attributed it to being something that's a little bit more sinister by calling it the terror. But then I think you also have people who are like, oh, it's Memphre. You know, it's not like it's not like this uh, this threatening thing. But I think that's that's neither here nor there. So I went first. Garrick, your first cryptid is up. I haven't listened to a whole lot of what you did. I told you a little bit about mine, which is technically kind of cheating, but I haven't really heard any of yours, so kind of lay it on me. What do you got? Okay. So I'm going to start with my first story. So according to local legend, residents of Berkshire and Richford, Vermont, um, were plagued by reports of a terrifying flying creature. Um, and this, this is an area, this Berkshire and Richford are extremely far north. They both sit. Um, between Lake Memphrey Magog and Lake Champlain, so they're in that kind of no man's land stretch at the, the top of Vermont, and they both border the Canadian province of Quebec. Like I said, they're they're all the way up there. It's a pretty mm -hmm. um, remote place, and this would normally be a very peaceful and tranquil place. It holds an old leg old legend. Of a beast known only as the Awful. And the Awful is said to be a flying beast with more than a 20 foot wingspan, a serpentine tail, and massive claws and gray skin. It's it's quite the description. It's pretty out of this world. And most reports have often described it as, you know, we look at legends and it sounds a lot like a, a griffin. 
mm-hmm. of medieval times. Griffins guarded the um, guarded the fortune of kings and rulers. Of course, that is all in like that's all legend. That's all not, legend, yeah. mythical folklore. I mean, you see griffins in like Harry Potter mm-hmm. and all the like the magical stuff. But this the description is very similar to that of a griffin. You know the massive wings the tail of a serpent the you know the face of an of an eagle although they, they never really describe the face they always describe the wings and the tail and it having really big claws but they don't ever really describe the face um, but the first reported sighting of the awful occurred in the early 1900s and came from two sawmill workers from richford um, the men were reportedly crossing the Main Street Bridge in Richford when they noticed the incredibly large beast perched on a nearby rooftop looking down at them. Some stories say that one of the men suffered a fear-induced heart attack and had to be carried home. That's metal. And was reportedly played <laughs> by nightmares mm-hmm. and would wake up in the middle of the night screaming. And yeah, so this guy, you know, fear-induced heart attack had nightmares for months or whatever i guess he made a full recovery again i don't know how true that is i mean the whole fear induced heart attack on the spot they had to carry him home like it makes for a good story whether or not it's the truth i mean who knows it's a sighting from the very early 1900s um but over the next few months locals continued to report seeing the creature some locals claimed to see it land on their homes well, others say they saw it soaring over their farm fields. Uh, one farm wife named Oella Hopkins was hanging laundry up to dry one day when she noticed the family dog start to bark uncontrollably. When she turned to investigate, Oella saw the awful perched upon her farmhouse roof glaring down at her. She ran inside and reportedly hid under her bed for hours. Although with multiple locals seeing the creature... It was never reported to have harmed anybody. It only ever watched them. Never attacked anybody, never attacked livestock. There are no reports of it hurting anybody or anything. All it liked to do is land on your house. or mm-hmm. you, It was houses. It liked to land on the roof of people's homes and just look at you. Which is kind of, I, I don't know if that's scarier than it you know, flying off with a cow or the fact that it wants nothing to do with you or its livestock. It just wants to look at you. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be a very Vermont thing if it flew off with a cow, though. Yeah, I, I mean, fair. But it was... The story of this creature gained so much attention, especially in the Vermont region and the just the story of this giant winged beast mm-hmm. in, you know, rural northern Vermont gained so much traction that... The story made its way to the legendary horror writer, H.P. Lovecraft, who is said to have traveled to the area of Berkshire and Richford to investigate the reports. And that that was about, I think it was 1920, or it was around the time of 1920, he traveled from from his home state of Rhode Island up to investigate. Um, He, of course, he never saw the creature in his travels, but... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he is said to have traveled up there to investigate, and I, I, it was kind of a, a trip he left on the down low, because, you know, he was still very popular, people knew who H.P. Lovecraft was, you know, mm-hmm. it's like... So did he do, in your research, did he do any works of writing or based on the awful, or was it just kind of one of those things where he was curious by it and just kind of went up there? I think he took some inspiration from it Mm -hmm. and did put it in some of his novels but i didn't see like he didn't base like a specific book about it or Mm -hmm. anything like that yeah but i do think he did take this some of the the stories and translated some of that into his writing Mm -hmm. although i didn't find like he didn't write a specific book on the awful or you know anything like that um But then uh, sightings of the awful quickly died out after 1925, although as recently as 2006, a Richford resident 
claims to have seen a giant winged creature that swooped out from the sky and plucked a crow from the top of a pine tree and then quickly flew away. Although the witness gave no description of the creature other than it just being a massive animal that had wings and it could fly. They, mm -hmm. The witness gave no description of what it looked like or what it was or anything like that. Um, and then there was a... This 2006 sighting, this claim, started a chain of others that came forward and said they too, you know, had saw a giant winged creature. Um, like, a lady came forward and said that she and her friends saw a creature when they were about 10 years old, sitting in a tree near the Trout River. And the beast was said to have watched them for a few minutes and then quickly um, watched them for a few minutes. They looked away. It had flown off had left um and this is they said they were about 10 when they saw this happen and although this witness did describe the creature and they described it as having a beak and described it more similar to a pterodactyl and not that of a griffin like <laughs> creature that the 19 the earth the sightings in the 1900s and the 1920s described <laughs> it as this lady said it looked more like a pterodactyl. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean to cut you off there, but I think it's that's interesting because it's like you know a few weeks ago I did a whole episode on the Van Meter Visitor. Yeah, and the the idea that it looks like a pterodactyl is interesting because I can't oh geez I can't remember when the awful was first sighted in in, in Iowa, but this would make another instance of across the United States somebody seeing something that looks like a like a pterodactyl, like, something like a else, dinosaur. Yeah. Um, so I think that's interesting. And then you have some people, you know, if you want to go into the Thunderbird legend, some people think the Thunderbird looks like looks like a pterodactyl too. So, so. I do. I did say that. I in in some of my research, um, I I did see that a lot of locals said the big thing is you could always, I guess, hear it before you could see it. You know, it often let out a low, quote-unquote, screaming sound, and as well the flapping of its wings. So if it really was a giant winged creature, I'm sure you, you probably could hear it flapping its wings. If it says, you know, 20-foot wingspan, mm -hmm. you know, I, I believe that. Um, so, you know, what is what really is the awful? I mean, nobody really knows, because, of course, the... The original sightings in the early 1900s to the 1920s were, you know, it's a griffin, you know, that's the description. And then, you know, the couple sightings, you know, one in 2006, and then the other lady said she saw it near the Trout River, which I did not find a year on that, or a date for that sighting. Um, they described it as, again, more like a, you know, a mm -hmm. pterosaur, a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Um so, I mean, is it really just, is it one species of cryptid, or is it, you know, I did find um, somebody mentioned that, you know, maybe it's tied into the Native American legend of the Thunderbirds, mm -hmm. which were massive bird-like animals that have been reported by the inhabitants of this area since, you know, the 16th century. So it's a really old Native American legend. So maybe, maybe that has something to do with it, but um, who knows? You know, maybe the awful died out in 1925, that this original griffin-like creature, and, you know, maybe the more recent sightings are that of, of a different animal. You know, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't really know, but, I mean, what are your thoughts? It's, it's kind of an interesting story. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely an interesting story. I think if I were to go with anything, I think I would go on the realm of, again, not the, not the cool, flashy theory, but, I mean, what if this was, like, I mean, beak, they say beak, they say tail. I, but I think the idea of it having a tail could be very, like, up for interpretation, I think. Sure. I think if you said, like, you know, we, we, we've personally seen eagles or hawks or things of that nature that are absolutely ginormous and obviously this was 1920 
So I would say that force deforestation has probably not hit them as hard. So you, what if you say, and this is all speculation. I'm just going on. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just firing from the hip here. What, what if you say that there was a population in that area with it being so remote of just eagles or hawks that are just absolutely huge? And then with yeah. the advancement of modern technology, the logging industry, you know, um, that area becoming more populated as we get into, you know, the, the 21st century, could that be that it's... It's just, you know, they died out. It was just a gigantic species of hawk that people had never seen before or and then it just kind of died out and it was only a very small population of them. And that would explain why, you know, the witnesses didn't see it take anything because I've never seen a report of a, of a giant hawk that would lug off a cow. You know, you see reports yeah. of hawks, you know, they swoop down and they pick up babies and stuff like that but that's like that's once in a lifetime occurrence and that's present day yeah you know so i don't think a like a giant hawk would lug off a person you know it's like what's it's like only hawks can only lift half their body weight or eagles and hawks can only pick up only half their body weight yeah they have to be double the size yeah like raptor so, birds that pick pick up prey animals yeah. have to be at least so if i were size. to go with anything again not not the coolest of the theories obviously but I'm going to play it on the side of skepticism and say that maybe this was a giant subspecies of hawk that has just remained kind of undiscovered. Yeah, I mean, there's a good chance of it. I mean, again, it's... One thing I, I kept trying to look for was why they called it the awful. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked and looked and looked, and I could not figure out where the name came from, mm -hmm. who, you know, who's the first person to call it that. I couldn't find it anything. And it's, it, it, you know, so weird that they, they called it the awful, but, it, you know, it never hurt anybody. There's no reports mm -hmm. of it hurting anybody. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, it never attacked, it didn't never attack anybody. It showed no malicious intent. All it ever did was, was watch people, which is weird. Yeah. But, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I dug and dug to try and see where the name came from or who coined the name. And I, I couldn't find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool and interesting story yeah. for sure. It's definitely it's definitely an interesting one. Um, but with that being said, I want to move on to my second one. And I've told you a little bit about this one. Um, and that being of the Pigman. The Vermont the Vermont Pigman. And now, you might be thinking, what the fuck is the pig man? Um, and I'm going to tell you the story behind the Vermont pig man. Um, and this one is a little bit more that's out there. It's more a little urban legendist, you know, legend E, legend E, urban legend E esque. esque. Legend esque. Leg yeah, legend esque. Um, but it's interesting. So I'm going to tell you the story of the Vermont pig man. Now, the story of the pig man starts in 1971 in Northfield, Vermont. Now, in the middle of the night, a farmer went outside to investigate some strange noises coming from his backyard. When the farmer went outside, thinking that it would just be a raccoon or a squirrel or maybe even a bear digging through his garbage, instead he was met with the sight of a man-sized creature covered in white hair with the facial features of a pig. Now, flashback, believe it or not, this is not the reported first case of the pig man being in Vermont. The story in the legend of the folklore starts 20 years earlier in 1951. On October 30th of that year, 17-year-old Sam Harris went out on the town in an attempt to cause some mischief. This was Northfield's quote-unquote picket night, which to what I could find was kind of like a made-up day for kids to cause mischief around Halloween time, you know, go out and prank people and throw eggs at houses and shit like that. It's weird they had to have a day for it. I think it was like, like a made-up day. It wasn't like the it was like the day the kids go out and cause mischief, you know, right. the day before Halloween. That's what I could find anyway. Now, Sam went out on the town armed with eggs with the idea in mind to vandalize some houses, which is just great. Sure. Yeah. Um, however, Sam never returned. A large search party was launched with hundreds of locals and police officers, but they didn't turn up with anything. They couldn't find any trace of Sam, where he went, or anything like that. Now, the rumors in local legend spread about what happened. 
with some rumors being that he just ran away from home, with some being more sinister, claiming that he had been kidnapped, or rather something got him in the woods. However, that slowly morphed into the idea that Sam stumbled into something in the woods that night that he probably shouldn't have. Whether that be the pig man itself, or something more sinister that turned him into the pig man. Neither one is for certain, that's kind of all legend. But according to local lore, Sam was the type of person that wasn't too nice to animals. He regularly was an animal abuser and had a affinity for slaughtering pigs and hollowing out their skulls to make into masks. Now, that's pretty fucked up, to say the least, and it would make sense. This sounds like... It sounds like the plot of probably a really good horror movie. Probably, You know, yeah. the, the animal abuser gets, you know, a curse put on him. He turns into a pig That man. makes him this, <laughs> the same thing that he abuses... I, there's a movie about something like that somewhere. Um, but this is, I guess, all legend. Um, now, Sam would obviously hollow out their skulls to make into masks, like he was known to do that. And needless to say, that's some pretty fucked up shit. Um, but back to the story. Now, shortly after the farmer saw the creature rummin rummaging through his trash in the backyard, and this is back to 1971, a, only a few days later, after the farmer had his first encounter, a group of teenagers at the local high school snuck away from the dance that was going on at the school to go drink out of the sandpit that was just a short distance away. While they were out drinking in the sandpit, a creature came out of the nearby forest tree line. The kids described it as walking on two legs, covered in white fur, with the face of a pig. The kids were terrified and ran back inside of the high school for safety. Some other students went outside to see if they could investigate and see the creature, but only found the beer cans that the other kids were drinking from. Now, the local legend has remained just that, and maybe people who went out looking for the pig man during this time have said that he resides in an area of the woods known as the Devil's Wash Bowl, which is a area that is kind of, it's a stretch of dirt road that goes through the woods, and it's kind of complete with numerous caves around that area, and a stretch of a rough whitewater creek as well. Now, in doing my research on this, I found a post on Reddit from 11 years ago and this, and it was on a subreddit called r slash no sleep, in, in which a boy who lived in this area detailed an account in which stories during this time period, and I'll go into basically what a summarized synopsis of what this Reddit post said, is that he lived in this area in Vermont in the 80s, I believe, um, and The Legend of the Pigman was very popular, so... In this story, he says that a group of couples, including his his sister and her, his sister's boyfriend, um, went out to try and see the pig man, and they camped out in the area around the Devil's Wash Bowl. Now, the Reddit poster says that his sister and her boyfriend were with that group that camped out there, and one night while camping, trying to find look for the pig man, um, his sister and her boyfriend were trying to start a fire in their cave when they heard hollering and screaming coming from one of the other caves where another couple was camped out. When his sister and her boyfriend arrived, they found one girl curled up in the corner of her cave, extremely scared, with her boyfriend not in the cave. She then went on to tell an account in which the pig man came into their cave, and they tried to scare him off. The pig man was not scared, because he's the pig man, and instead grabbed a large rock, struck the boyfriend over the head with the rock, and picked him up and took him out of the cave. The boyfriend was not found after an extensive search, and the only evidence that the pig man was there was some footprints left in the mud outside of the cave. The Redditor goes on to tell a little bit more of the story of someone possibly seeing this boyfriend that was struck by the rock later on, looking like he was almost possessed by an unknown force with white fur on his body, much like the pig man. Now, before we go any deeper into theories and discuss this, because the look on your face is telling me like you're just, you can't believe a single word of this. And it's important to, to note this when I was doing my digging. Now, the Redditor who posted this on this subreddit 11 years ago had actually attached his Facebook profile to the account. So I clicked on it. It turns out this Redditor, who I won't say his name, but it, like if you Google Pigman or like the Vermont Pigman, that Reddit post will come right up on r slash no sleep and you can figure out the dude who posted it. So I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say the guy's name because I'm not going to like out him. Um... But if you go into the Reddit conversation and you click his Facebook 
profile, it turns out that he is a horror author. And that he has a Patreon account that is dedicated to horror stories and subgenres of horror that he creates. Whether or not he was doing this 11 years ago when he posted this original story on r slash no sleep about an encounter that his sister and her boyfriend had with the pig man, I don't know. That I could not find. But I think it was very interesting that he is a horror author um, and you can go and you can scroll down his Facebook profile and you can see that, you know, right in his bio, he's like, I write horror, horror fiction or I'm a horror author. So it kind of casts doubt to that story entirely, I feel like. Yeah. So with that being said, thoughts and theories about the pig man, very small sample size in terms of the pig man, but I think the legend is more mysterious than like the couple sighting. It's, it's this legend of this for lack of a better term, bovine beast, you know, that's just kind of... Bovine means cow, dude. Oh, well, it's whatever. I was trying to think of a play on words. That's fine. Probably cringeworthy, but it's fine. But this this man, pig, I'm not going to say bear, because that'd be South Park reference. Um, but yeah, kind of very mysterious, kind of legend-filled, kind of... Spooky urban legend, kind of goosebumps esque kind of story. Yeah, it's kind of what I get. Yeah, very goosebumpsy. Like, uh, like the two settings where it's like, I think I believe the guy who was like, oh, there's an animal outside in my trash. I went outside and I saw a man pig. Like, yeah, okay. And then it's like, oh, there's a bunch of seventeen year old kids drinking in a sand pit behind a high school mm -hmm. which i mean makes sense i mean that's what mm -hmm. every high school kid does but like you can't if they're drinking heavily it's in the middle of a school dance like mm -hmm. i think so they, you're saying they hallucinated the pig man i think they <laughs> i think they maybe saw something else and if it's such a local legend like ingrained they thought they saw the they pig man. thought they saw the pig man well the first sighting well counter off what, that what if the, I, the weird thing is they say it has it's white hair yeah you don't see a ton of like animals with white hair unless it's a like albino you know what i mean i mm -hmm. and that and it's like it's a it's a man mm -hmm. covered in white hair that's a pig that has a pig face like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's very specific it for being like two actual sightings of this thing they're very like, it, it's a body of a man that has white fur and a pig head. Like, uh, it's funny. I think it's just a really, really funny local legend. And I, I think it's a mistaken identity thing, probably. But it is, it's a cool story because it is so, I think, I think, so ingrained and in In my legend. opinion, I think that, you know, you have the two notable sightings in 1971. And I couldn't really find through any of my other digging of people saying, like, they went out in the woods and this is the 90s or whatever and people saw the pig man. You know, I can't really yeah. find anything on that. All I saw was the two the two sightings in 1971. So, in Are my there... opinion, I think that this, this story is entirely fabricated. And the reason why I think that is because I took it a step further and I'm like, okay, if the story starts in 1951 with this kid named Sam Harris, a 17-year-old kid, right? The story starts there. He went missing. Nobody could find him, right? Either he turned into the pig man or the pig man got him in the woods or whatever happened, right? So yeah. I decided to look in to the Vermont State Police Missing Persons Archive. Okay. And there is no record of a 17-year-old named Sam Harris who disappeared in Northfield, Vermont in 1951. There is okay. no record of that. So, whether or not this predated the Vermont State Police's cold case archives, but I don't think it does because the Vermont State Police got established when Paula Jean Weldon disappeared from the Bennington area, and I think that was 1946. That was like the yeah. 40s. Wait, what year did you so, say Sam Harris went missing? 1951. Okay. Yeah, I'm on a a website here too yeah it says the same thing so you google sam harris northfield vermont missing persons it comes up with the pigman articles okay so, so it's it doesn't come up with a profile from the vermont cold case database or the vermont state police missing persons database 
that does not come up. Yeah, okay. And it was kind of easy to search because Vermont actually doesn't have a whole lot of missing people cases that are open still. They have probably about a dozen. That's it. Um, so, yeah, there's no record of a 17-year-old Sam Harris disappearing in Northfield, Vermont in 1951. So I think that kind of throws that theory completely out the window. I think it's cool to think about in terms of a legend, but I think that that's really what this is. This is a legend through and through in that maybe, whether it be parents or the community kind of made it up to scare the kids, to keep them to stay home so they don't go out at night or, you know, so they just, you know, don't go out drinking. You know, they use the example, oh, kids are out drinking. You know, you don't want to go out in the woods and start drinking. The pig man's going to get you, you know? So I think that that's what this possibly is. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but I definitely think that that's what it is. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just a, a, a local legend that is just so ingrained in the town's identity that... Yeah, I think it, I think it's a big like mistaken identity thing. Again, if it's one of those things, like we've both said, just so ingrained in the town's culture and this legend, mm -hmm. then I think that's mm -hmm. you know that's what it is. it's all mistaken identity. I think, and the fact that there's only been two sightings is like, well, two s reported sightings. You know that just lends credibility to the fact where it's like it's a story you told children not to go out and you know, out in the woods at night, mm -hmm. you know, so, or the, the high school students of like, if they leave a school dance to go illegally drink in the woods, yeah. but ran into a monster, you know, yeah. that's, it's a, don't go at night. There's things in the woods mm -hmm. kind of, you know, just one of those kind of stories. Yeah. So with that being said, I'll throw the ball back in your court for the last cryptid that you, that you've managed to find. We'll move away from the pig man. Cause I think we could just keep talking sure. about the pig man for a long time. Um, so my next one, it's a little smaller. It's, you know, similar to the, the story of the pig man in, in size, it's, mm -hmm. but, uh, deep in Addison County stands a mountain shrouded in just a, it's an, it's an eerie aura, you know, Addison County, mm -hmm. it, it's very flat, you know, it's down in the valleys, um, about the middle, the middle part of Vermont, uh, and it's, it's very flat, but there's a, a mountain that sticks out right in the middle of the county. And you know, it sticks out like a sore thumb, which gives it this very weird, eerie aura to it. Um, and this place, it's, this mysterious place is called Snake Mountain. So Snake Mountain sits on more than a 1,200-acre wildlife management area of the same name. So it's Snake Mountain Wildlife protection area whatever that wildlife management area um the mountain according to some was originally called rattlesnake mountain um and it was said to be home to the only venomous reptile in the state which of course was rattlesnakes but it's mm. not it'd be the timbered rattlesnake correct yes yeah. they're they're in new hampshire and they're in very small portions of vermont as well but there are no rattlesnakes on snake mountain it's just a it's just a tail. There are no, um, fortunately, there are no rattlesnakes on Snake Mountain. Um, but atop the atop this, it's a twelve hundred and eighty-seven foot high mountain. sits a desolate wetland known as Cranberry Bog, which is said to be over ninety-five hundred years old, and was said to have formed after the retreat of the last glacier in Vermont. The bog, however, is unmarked and is not a common place for tourists and locals to venture off to. I just added that tidbit because I thought it was a cool piece of history that this this mountain in the middle of a f otherwise flat valley has a marsh at the top of it that's, you know, almost 10,000 years old. Like, that's just, I thought it was cool, so I mm -hmm. figured I had to add it. Yeah. Um, but this mountain is said to harbor a creature known only as the Black Beast of Snake Mountain. Sightings of this elusive animal date back to the 1920s and 30s. This creature often stalked the jagged slopes and hills of the mountain, terrorizing locals and farmers. Unlike some other cryptids we've spoke about, the black beast is said to be nothing short of savage. Reports describe the beast as a massive black-furred creature with massive claws and glowing red eyes. Most eyewitness accounts claim the creature to be elusive, often lurking behind buildings and barns that dot the landscape. So, you know, it likes to likes to hide around, you know, you 
You're not going to see it unless it wants you to see it. But it, it, it it's truly terrifying as everything I could find about this creature. Um, the one really interesting sighting was one chilling account came from a woman who was driving home from visiting a friend when she says the creature appeared and began to chase her vehicle down the road. As she began to panic, she sped up, but so did the creature, quickly gaining ground behind her. Fearing she might crash, she pulled into the yard of the closest farm. The creature then jumped onto the roof of her car and began clawing at the roof of her vehicle. The driver did the only thing she could do, and she laid on the horn of her car. One of the owners of the farm came outside to investigate, and she turned on the farm's floodlights and also saw the beast and ran back inside in terror. The men on the farm then grabbed their guns and ran out, to, ran out front to confront the beast, but when they arrived, the creature had retreated back into the darkness of the night. A few other scarce reports of the creature claim that it would jump tree to tree, scaring, ch scaring farm children. Mm -hmm. You know, around the mountain, it's... it's it's farmland. It's all fields and farms. So this thing would jump between the tr trees, like scaring farm children, playing, just being a, a general a, a nuisance, a terror. Like, it, it's a big black animal that's just jumping between trees. Mm -hmm. um, numerous farmers claimed they would shoot at the beast a lot, um, but they never... They, they would never hit it. You know, they, they'd they always shoot at it, and it would just it would disappear, and it would vanish without a trace. And then, you know, sightings really died out in the, you know, the late 1920s, early 1930s. And the legend of the monster that, snock, that stalked Snake Mountain faded into memory in that of folklore. So it's, it's very, like... It's just it's just weird claims. Again, not a lot, not a ton of sightings, mm -hmm. but it was just kind of like there's a thing that there's you know there's a monster that lives on the mountain, mm -hmm. and it's very elusive, but it's also very aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I to me personally, it sounds a lot of like the the farms that are around the mountain. You know, it's like hey kids, don't don't go yeah. up the mountain. I think that was the I'm sure they told children that as, again, a don't go outside at night or yeah. the, you know, the monster on Snake Mountain is going to come, come and get you, come and get you. Yeah. Um, but like the one sighting that had a ton of validity, of course, the woman driving home mm -hmm. by the mountain who yeah. ran into it, that I'm not so sure about because that's a, you know, it's an adult woman. Mm -hmm. She saw it. And then one of the owners of the farm, of the farm she pulled into that woman saw it as well. So that's mm -hmm. two people who actually saw it. And um, the farm wife or the farm, w the woman who was an owner of the farm, she turned on her floodlights and saw it. The, the yeah. floodlights on the front of her farm and saw it. So that's that's two people who are a adults. You know, they're not kids. It's not a, I wouldn't think it'd be a, a you know, yeah. kids spinning a yarn, but. I think, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. I think. What I'm gonna, as you're telling me this story, I think the direction I'm gonna go with the theory is that there's that this could be, and hear me out, possibly a from how you described it. It sounds to me like it's a black bear, but obviously, kind of the vagueness in the reports doesn't really, you know, say yes or no on whether or not this is a black bear. Sure. So I think the idea that this could be a a black bear with rabies. The original story was that a black bear with rabies, which would make it hyper aggressive, which would make it basically be extremely violent. And then you take that story of the black bear with rabies and you say, okay, yeah, it chases the car down the road. It would make sense. Bears, when they run at full speed, they're incredibly fast. Yeah, that is so true. So it would make sense that the bear would be reasonably behind the woman's car. I, it depends on how fast she's driving. Could I could be a little bit of a stretch of the from imagination. From what I saw, I, I did look at the roads surrounding Snake Mountain. And the more rural roads are, they're small. They're yeah. windy. They're, you know, this the speed limit isn't very fast. Yeah. Uh, the closest, like, highway is Vermont 22A. And that highway, or that road, it's not even a highway, 
only has a maximum speed of 45, and that's a stri- yeah. that's a straight road. And this was in what year? 1920? 1920. Yeah, so there's no way that car is going any faster than 20, 25 miles an hour. Yeah, it was... There's no way. Um, so, they it didn't, would be They didn't date li- it. Yeah. The the woman in the car, she didn't... I did not find a date to that story, but I just saw the, the only sightings took place between the 1920s till, mm-hmm. you know, the the late 1920s and early 1930s. Yeah. So to me, I think that sounds like this car possibly could be a rabid black bear. And yeah. then once the kind of the stories died out or maybe the bear died, it kind of, again, morphed into this idea of local legend folklore. Like, oh, yeah, kids, you know, obviously this mountain kind of sticks out, like you mentioned, like a sore thumb. Like, okay, we got to make sure that the kids aren't going to the mountain because there could be all sorts of stuff up there. And the, we could say, oh, the Black Beast is staying mountains up there. The Black Beast will get you, you know, if you're out past 8 p.m. and you're not home for dinner. Yeah. You know, so I think that feeds into it heavily. But I think maybe sure. the initial account could be that it was a rabid black bear and it was just kind of like very elusive and they kind of left it mysterious because it's like, oh, but it's the Black Beast of Snake Mountain because it displays characteristics that we don't normally see from black bears. So yeah, the the aggressive the aggressiveness yeah. was marked numerous times, and again, if it was mm-hmm. a I think a, it's a, like you said a yeah. rabid black bear either you know maybe it had um, mange or maybe even a, a, a skin condition, which caused like maybe hair to fall off maybe in the face mm-hmm. or on the body that would you know distort it you know so it wouldn't yeah. look like the the run of the mill black bear, but it would look different so it was more mm-hmm. of a beast. And not a bear. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think... I don't know, it was a cool story. Again, similar to the Pigman, like, one confirmed sighting, because it was only because it was from two people that saw it. Mm-hmm. And then, after that, it was... That was pretty much They're it. like, oh, it would jump between trees. And, and black bears do climb trees. Mm-hmm. What Jumping between yeah, trees... Yeah, jumping between I, trees might be a little bit of a stretch. I haven't seen a black bear jump from tree to tree, because... Well, they're not... Ma- black bears they are not. Jump. They are not built to jump from tree but to tree. But they can move rather quickly down a tree and up another tree. Yeah. So, again, maybe that's the whole... Mm-hmm. And they did say... it. They did say it was massive, so nothing small. It's weird... They say it was a massive black animal, but then also said it was somehow elusive. It would hide. Mm-hmm. So it's weird that an animal so big would hide. Yeah. But I don't know. Again, it's, yeah, it's it, a story. Yeah, it's definitely interesting, and um, I appreciate you for coming forward with the two cryptids that you did. And obviously, we'll try and do this Cryptids Across America series when we can, while I try and intertwine some other episodes. Um, but that's going to pretty much conclude today's episode on the first entry of the Cryptids Across America series. I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, this would be our longest episode to date by a great margin. So I hope you stay to that you stay through the entire thing. Um, but with that being said, now at the very end of the episode, of course, it's obligatory self plug time. Um, If you were listening to this on YouTube, I'm also on Spotify, you can go and turn on notifications and subscribe so you get notified every time I post a new episode. Same thing goes for YouTube. If you're listening to this on Spotify, I am also on YouTube. Please go subscribe to me over there. Leave a comment. It helps out the algorithm, helps you get more views, and I greatly appreciate it. I am also on Instagram. That is Unblurring the Unknown. You can see our brand new cover art that I have generated for every new episode, as well as pictures that are relevant to this week's episode. So please go and follow me on Instagram. That is Unblurring the Unknown on Instagram. As well, you can also send me topic suggestions. Feel free to send those to my email, and that's unblurringtheunknown at gmail.com. I will say that again, unblurringtheunknown at gmail.com. Send me any topic suggestions you want to see me cover. Um, The topic queue is getting kind of large, so between doing the Cryptids Across America series and my regular episode queue, it's starting to fill up a little bit. And then obviously there's crazy shit happening in the news all the time, so that might make its way in there as well. But with that being said, I'd like to thank you for tuning into this week's episode. Big thank you for my brother for doing co-host duties with me this week for our very first Cryptids Across America series. But with that being said, thank you for listening, and I will see you on the next one.